So I just uh, show you this picture and keep it in mind uh, because of these two views we discussed several times today, the transcendental level and the transcendent level of thinking and the differences because I will zoom in on this question later and I leave this uh, slide for the uh, final discussion. So I just go back to the first, if I can, it doesn't move yet. Yeah, I go back to the first. So here we are. I regard Edith Stein as the co-genius of Edmund Husserl, as you see. He was the master, no doubt, Thus, his transcendental phenomenology was further elaborated, I would say, by Edith Stein's vision, the so-called eidetic phenomenology. Husserl's aim was to constitute a precise phenomenology following the ideal of mathematics. It puts exigent existence into brackets, but his philosophy even touches metaphysics. That asked for a radical change of attitude by the epoch and the phenomenological reduction. The transcendental a priori is the condition sine qua non for his new view. Stein aims, however, uh, aim, however, was to analyze the human person. He strived for the comprehensive constitution of the object in the subject. Stein asked about the constitution of the human person, not only in the analyzing subject, but as a subject of its own. Husserl fears a return to the psychological subject, the psychologism he tried to overcome. This is why he chooses the way of transcendental phenomenology, with a, which according to Stein, as others of a generation, is not necessary. The aim of phenomenology is evidence. This is what Husserl is striving for. The absolute clear view of the essence available by intuition. His vision can be illustrated by the triangle of evidence. And I added the difference to Edith Stein's view in white. Husserl searches for clear notions beyond what he called equivocation, similar words used for expressing different concepts. Unclear notions lead to unclear research. In order to find the right notion, the subject must be as ideal as possible. Husserl calls it the pure I, the subject beyond psychologism. The object must be as ideal as well, the imminent object, the object represented in consciousness. As Husserl, Edith Stein strives for a precise notion which expresses the essence but she considers another kind of subject and object. First, Husserl. Um, in Husserl's construction, the pure eye is the point of departure and the center of the stream of consciousness. According to the phenomenological terminology, Husserl assesses the real eye, the complex person, as transcendent. The transcendental or pure eye is immanent. That means that, that it is the center of the imminent consciousness. The pure eye is also the pole of actu actuality. In its thoughts, the eye becomes aware of itself. The eye is identical, individual, and free of all qualities. It constitutes the identity of the stream of consciousness. The pure eye is also the freely acting subject, like the subject of the Cartesian cogito. This acting seems to have a specific personal quality, which includes feelings, freedom, and even bodily experiences. Though it reflects the concrete surroundings and all its qualities, the I itself stays transcendental. The real I, however, is a transcendent reality. Husserl first thinks that a transition from the pure I to the personal I is possible. Later, he corrects himself and states, the identity is rooted in the pure eye. The real eye is its counterpart. The pure eye constitutes the real eye. The latter seems to be part of the, its surroundings, its experiences, and even its objects. The real eye is bound to the body. It constitutes a kind of materiality of the soul. 
The soul is a complex entity with different layers. It is given to the pure eye as a transcendent reality like the body. Its unity is constituted by experiencing. The real I is a psychological entity, the subject of the stream of experience. The real I, its body, and all surroundings are constituted by the pure I in the immanent sphere, so in the consciousness. The personal I, which constitutes itself as a person, cannot be known with the same undeniable clearness as the pure I, which would be the ideal. The question, however, how this constitution takes place, stays open. Stein calls this the irrational rest of transcendent, uh, transcendental phenomenology. Personal I in Stein, methodologically important, Stein chooses the same point of departure, the pure I, the re reduction of the psychophysical, uh, psychophysiological I, which has no quality and is not part of the world. It is the unifying point of consciousness and is such an absolute being. But Stein regains the personal I as a point of departure. She sees that we meet ourselves as, as psychophysiological individuals in the consciousness itself. Thus, the personal quality of the I is given in transcendental reduction. The gap between the transcendental consciousness immanence and the transcendent world can be overcome in the personal consciousness. In Stein's version, the acting I is the personal I, the I between immanence and transcendence. The pure eye without any quality cannot experience the quality of the transcendent world, as states Stein. The original consciousness of the personal eye is more than the imminent stream of consciousness. Its memory is more than mere retention. It is profound. The stream of consciousness is related to the personal structure of the eye, to the soul. The soul is where the personal eye lives. It comprehends the quality of the soul, and it is the real center of acting. In this regard, Stein differs from Husserl. So this is my diagram to explain it a little bit. We will fall back to this later. The different in the vision of the object. Husserl describes two different kinds of perception. The object is given first in phenomenological reduction, or second by concrete experience. The ideal object is the imminent object, which cannot be questioned. This is why Husserl wants to transfer each object into the imminent sphere. The noema, the thing to be analyzed, is not the essence itself. Husserl splits the imminent sphere, the sphere of the essence, a priori, from the transcendent sphere, the concrete object, a posteriori. The constitution comprehends values, persons, and all experiences. The quality of the eye in uh, of the eye in Stein meets the quality of the object. Stein uses Husserl's threefold epoche and analyzes the representation of the object in the consciousness. This is the first step, but she does not forget about the concrete object the existing thing. Its ontic structure is never ideal, but during the constitution, it is perceived, intentionally given, and will be interpreted. The second step is the constitution of the value. The third step is the intersubjective constitution, also named by Husserl. The constitution of the values is of special interest in this context. Husserl treats axiology as a in a formal way. Stein, however, that's a lot, yeah. Stein, however, sees the value and the thing as such the good. Values are given to the person and they ask for personal answer. Only a subject of personal qualities is able to feel values, a capacity the pure eye does not have. Someone has switched on the microphone. 
hear some sound. The two, uh, the two streams of uh, phenomenology meet in the clear notion, I would say. The aim of phenomenology is the clear notion beyond equivocation. Uh, this is uh, the notion which expresses the, ex the essence. The aim is the completing assumption, a full in the Anschauung, the notion covering the full knowledge of the essence. The notion must even include all deep dimensions of the concept. This quality is, according to Stein, only given in the personal eye and not in the pure eye. The complete application will show it later. In what follows, I will discern positive phenomenology, negative phenomenology, and existential phenomenology. So first, Husserl's view on positive phenomenology, finding the essence. The phenomenological reduction goes in both directions. It reduces the object to its representation in consciousness, and it reduces the eye to the pure eye, both in order to find the true concept. The transcendental consciousness is the point of departure for all further knowledge, even for the exact sciences and psychology. All transcendent being is put into brackets. What remains is the consciousness as such. The pure consciousness is, according to Husserl, the only place for knowing the essence of the object and for knowing yourself. This last point could be interesting for psychology. Stein's vision on this. Stein applies with Husserl's methodology, but she does not forget the transition to transcendental does not follow his transition to a transcendental perception. She sticks to ontology, to the realistic view. Empirical psychology, however, chooses the other extreme. The essence does not play any role anymore. Basic concepts are missing. Phenology became attractive to Edith Stein as it precisely analyzes the notions. By clarifying the basic notions of anthropology, for example, Stein founded the basis for education as a science and for human sciences in general. The negative phenomenology. Stein and Husserl mainly strive for clarifying the essence by applying phenomenological reduction, the threefold epoche, and by exercising the phenomenological variation. An important step during this clarification is the negative negation of essential threads in order to see whether they are part of the essence or not. I will apply this to freedom as an essential thread of being. Both Husserl and Stein deal with this question and this finally in regard to what psychology does. The pure eye is free. It can appear on stage or disappear. But concrete persons live in concrete circumstances in causalities. They cannot leave uh, they cannot leave and which form them. Husserl describes psychology as exact science and even constructs a parallelism between the material reality and the human soul. The motivation in the soul itself, however, is different. It is a motivation by rationality. Understanding a person means to intuitively follow his or her life and to understand the nature of his or her motivation. Well, use can be motivating for a person if a person decides, decides to accept and implement them. Here, the subject reappears as a free person beyond strict causality. For this reason, Husserl finally discerns psychophysical causality from physic causality. The I is the subject of its act. It is characterized by rationality and autonomy. Therefore, the person mainly the acting pure eye is responsible. All experiences are experiences of the free person. Psychology must understand the complexity of this person. For this reason, exact sciences must be incorporated into the human sciences and their attitude has to be, according to Husserl, transcendental. Causality in Stein is the absence of freedom. In motivation, this essential thread of the human being would be present. According to Edith Stein and empirical psychology, 
overlooks the double law of causality and motivation. Steinker clarifies this in her research on psychic causality as a first step to a humanistic psychology. The free subject initiates the act. The free will can break the ban of causality as we can assume or suppress the influences. Sometimes it's, it seems as if the psyche is dominated by causality. But can the causality be calculated? Stein does research on this presumed causality. The subject can find the laws which reign in the person, but the essential freedom can overcome them. Thus, the re reaction of the person cannot be calculated. The free will characterizes the causality in the psyche as motivation. The spirit initiates a new causality by possible meaning. Motivation stimulates an act but does not force the person to react this way. In this, Stein is clearer than Husserl and Scheler. The negative phenomenology, which eliminates the possible freedom, shows one thing. Freedom is undeniably an essential thread of the human person. The implication for this possible, for a possible psychology is immediately clear. Freedom from psychic causality due to psychical wounds or a difficult past must be an essential aim of therapy. Stein now oversteps the sober analysis of a negative phenomenology and touches the existential dimension, the dimension given in the human experience. At this point, her decision to keep the personal eye as the acting subject becomes fruitful. This personal eye has access to its feelings, to the values, and to its own dignity. Dignity is the existential experience of freedom. The analysis of freedom in the text Freedom and Gra Grace is deeper than the rational analysis a transcendental philosophy can provide. And here I will give a very interesting remark. Stein first analyzes the possibility of absolute freedom. The eye leaving behind all restrictions gains total freedom, the transcendental freedom. But the eye gave up all possibilities. In this freedom, the eye would be totally bound, totally fixed. This transcendental analysis ends up in an existential paradox. The existential experience, however, is different. The point of absolute freedom is the point of departure, namely our starting point when we realize our concrete freedom. Freedom exists. It is only not used if you do not make any choice. The aim of the free act, the concrete realization of meaning, exists only in the ontological sphere. Freedom is not experienced as a transcendental threat, but in a concrete free action, whether it's a free thought, a free word, or a free action, always initiated by our will. And another example, emptiness and fullness. The yeah, okay, sorry, I skipped that <laughs> further. <laughs> uh, the relationship to the presumed meaning in life correlates with two existentials with fullness in the case of a meaningful relationship and with emptiness in the case of a destructive relationship. If a person frees itself from all influences and contents, nothing remains but emptiness. The eye as such is free but empty. However, fullness can not only be, be found beyond the eye. Being at home in the soul is its first possible experience of fullness. The eye feels that it is and that it finds meaning and fullness in its experiences. At that very moment, the human being touches another fullness, the one who carries his being. The person is afraid of not being. However, he, she does not strive for living forever, but rather for living the fullness of life ultimately provided by God.
We saw on the foundation of sciences. The first aim of a phenomenological foundation of science is the clarification of the essence of the science itself. Its key notions cannot be analyzed by the sci scientists themselves. This task remains in the hand of the philosophers, especially in the hands of phenomenologists. Phenomenology is the last resort. Beyond no place can be found for this kind of analysis. Pure phenomenology and humanistic psychology do research on this subject. Eidetic phenomenology deals with concrete reality, also Husserl state that, rather than with its transcendental reduction. Clarifying the methodology will be the next step. The phenomenological description prepares the empirical explanations both aim at objectivity. The analysis and the description of the essence is the aim of phenomenology. Therefore, it should precede each application. Phenomenology also discovers essential possibilities within the particular science. These analyses can provide an objective foundation for humanistic sciences. If you apply this to psychology as a humanistic science, each research in this field should be preceded by clear analysis of the person. It is an I, a subject, having a spirit, living in relationship to the surroundings and to other persons. All these relationships should be examined and realized. The fact that the person has a self-perception, a self-value and a self-willingness that he, she can be experienced and understood is crucial for developing a well-founded psychology. It is decisive for, for psychology to understand the essence of the subject's relatedness to others and to otherness in freedom and spirit. The way how the free I appears and acts in the person and how it constitutes the unity of all experiences. This helps to understand the complex process of motivation and empathy. Stein also provides a vision of the analysis of sciences. She strives for a foundation of a humanistic psychology as a descriptive and describing psychology, which differs from explaining psychology. It seems to be forbidden to speak about the soul in psychology. That's still true. <laughs> the ask, uh, task of a phenomenology is to clarify the basic concepts of an a priori psychology. This is precisely what Stein does in her Beiträge zur philosophischen Begründung der Psychologie und der Geisteswissenschaften. A psychology without soul, skipping the concept of soul, needs to be underpinned by phenomenological analysis of the essence. Psychology as empirical science tries to describe causalities and the mechanism of the soul, but it loses sight of the real living person. If I put it into a scheme, it's like we start with the theory, we should do phenomenological analysis of the context, then develop a criteriology, which helps to criteria for the empirical research. We get empirical facts out of the research, we make an evaluation, and then should again uh, have a phenomenological evaluation of the findings in order to very, have a very, get a verification or falsification of our hypothesis. Here that you see the role of phenomenology. Science, uh, no, beyond the existing concepts, thinking out of the box. In psychology, thinking in schools is very common. One of the main diagnostic instruments, the DSM, is based on fixed concepts on what a psychic disease is. Several symptoms are enumerated and translated into questions or statements that the patient will find in a questionnaire. The main problem is that these concepts are not questioned anymore. Once fixed, the concept of depression, personality disorder, etc., seems to be determined forever. However, the same symptoms can appear in different contexts. Being tired without, and without energy may be a sign for depression, but it's not its essence. Panic attacks after severe events and breaks in life are immediately linked to trauma. 
With my research on trauma based on Einstein's model of the soul, I was able to show that the essence of trauma cannot be brought back to severe incidents alone, but that micro-traumatization has the same effect, the emergency shutdown of the soul. This is the main essential threat. By the phenomenological analysis, I was able to show that trauma often appears in close relationships, even if abuse or violence cannot be seen on the outside. In relationships on which we de depend, you can easily be destroyed, such as by rape or murder. It would be a revolution for psychology and in juridical contexts to apply this concept of trauma. Stein provides the groundwork for this kind of thinking. Psychology should be based on a comprehensive anthropology. The concept of personhood differ in the different schools, as they are not able to provide philosophical and metaphysical analysis. In this regard, phenomenology can play a decisive role. And I apply this to the existential as a source of undeniable knowledge. The problem we must deal with. And that's the last speech. <laughs> the pro uh, problem we must deal with in the context of a meanwhile exact science like psychology is that we have to prove the humanistic insights in a convincing way. We saw that Stein has an existential approach in phenomenology. Existentials are essential relationships which are revealed by existential experiences. I enumerate them. Our identity is essentially linked to our I. During trauma, this relationship breaks. Individuality is our personal complexity, which may be broken by psychological rape. Our intellect needs truth, otherwise we lose our capacity to think logically. Our living body is bound to material resources, place and time. If you don't get that, like the aborted unborn child who did not get its time, we die. Our feelings deeply rooted in our soul need orientation in values and experience of dignity. Otherwise we lose ourselves or our humanity. We are social beings and need relationship without them, we will shrink. By language, willingly possible expressions as words, gestures, behaviors and mimic, we can show that we are human, that we can think and love and that we can claim our rights with language, we would be lost. Morality needs to be orientated to freedom and values. Otherwise, we lose ourselves in inhuman behavior and, uh, and ultimately hurt others. Transcendence must be orientated to a comprehensive meaning, finally to a transcendent person. Meaninglessness destroys our life. Human being cannot be without these relationships as his, her essential threats become visible and develop in these relationships. Existential relationships are thus the proof for the human essence. I conclude with a critical remark. How much of Edith Stein can be found in the Ideen Zwei? Some passages have the same diction as in her books, but the point of departure remains different. Husserl declares it clearly in the end of this book. He sticks uh, he seeks to the pure eye, to the transcendental point of view, transcendental point of view, and does not want to be misunderstood as someone who may be suspected of psychologism. This is his main concern. But by this, he misses the chance to make his phenomenology fruitful for human sciences. The existential experience is excluded. This is what Edith Stein definitely added. And this is her undeniable merit. Thank you very much.